Ron, welcome to Comic Book News. Oh, good. Uh, uh, now I couldn't hear a thing you were saying. It was just very jumbled. But, but you watch, good here. Okay, good. I apologize for that. You can watch, catch it on the replay. I had just said nice things about you, Ron, and what a what what a legend I consider you to be. It was on purpose, huh? <laughs> <laughs> as far as you know, anyway. That's what I said. Um, Ron, let's get right into your career. So you went to San Francisco State, like I did. You went there during when I went to San Francisco State. There was a giant student union built like a giant military complex. And they used to tell the stories of the, of the student unrest that went on, on at San Francisco state that caused them to build that thing. You went there during those times. And after that, you came to last gasp and produce slow death and some other stuff. But first give me a little bit into the insight, the secret origins of Ron Turner and how you got to San Francisco state and, and that stuff. Boy, <laughs> uh, there was a special program in the psych department for grad students called LAMA, Liberal Arts, Master of Arts. And there wasn't any, basically they took 12 students every year uh, and none of them up to that time in that program had not gone on and got their PhDs. My group was a little different. Um, first of all, uh, I had just, graduated from Fresno State, and I was the first in my family to do so, but I had no money. My When graduation came, I couldn't afford the cap and gown, so I, my mom and I sat out in the audience. They wouldn't let us on the stage without a cap and gown, and I had to go up and get my diploma from the, you know, from the audience, and uh, that always stuck a little bit in my craw, but I was off to San Francisco in six, fall of 67, but I had I had a good paying job. I was a brakeman on the railroad and in Fresno, and I couldn't afford to quit the job. So I commuted between San Francisco State and Fresno for the railroad for several months while I was up there. And things were going along okay, and I rose. I did really well. I got to be head of the Honor Society for the psych department, psych uh, chi, and uh, everything was going well. And I had gone up there essentially to get away from politics because if I didn't, I just wouldn't be able to graduate. And being the first to get out of college was enough, I thought, my family. But I'd like to get a PhD. So, um, well, one day there was a, a big riot on campus as the state of California was trying to stop a black student's uh, program. And so... Uh, the bookstore was vandalized and a lot of briefcases were stolen, et cetera. And there was a lot of great uh, students in the Black Students Union there, like Danny Glover became a good actor, and uh, Benny Stewart, I don't know. Whole bunch, anyway, there's a whole bunch of people that were good folks that were part of that. And there was a group I used to have coffee with in the cafeteria where they, uh, and the, there was this huge grounds outside the cafeteria where people would always be demonstrating and doing things. And there was a big rally planned and we, we threw, we had formed a group called the non organization to uh, collect money to pay for the damages because it turned out that the state of California decided to not insure their buildings to damage like that because they figured they saved enough money by not paying insurance premiums that should anything ever happen to a building, which was unlikely, uh, they'd be able to pay for it out of their general funds. And but of course, they, they didn't have any money to pay for this. So they were going to try to get revenge from the students for causing them this damage, even though it should have been insured anyway. But it right. wasn't from their own greed. So we held this rally, and about 20 minutes before the rally, uh, I'd gotten some empty Folger three-pound tins, coffee tins, empties, to stand around, and we were going to pass out these cans to fill with money to take to give to the faculty. And so the guy who was supposed to speak 
got, got laryngitis and I got thrust up on the platform to do a speech. So I, I didn't know what to do. So I, I thought, well, I'd gone to one of these A.A. Allen. We used to do pranks on some of the roaming evangelicals around Fresno. Like we'd go down to the disabled vets and get all, you know, buy 20 crutches and go a bunch of us would go in there with their crutches and then get on stage and get saved from our crippleness and throw our crutches away and run out. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that was a pretty good trick. Let's see what we can do here. So I remember some of the patter that was going on from the, the Christians. And I just kind of like ran it like a, uh, a revival. And unbelievably, the, the cans all got filled up with money. And we ran off to the, the where the school was having a, a faculty meeting and marched in and they said, and everybody, all the professors are going, oh, dear, now we're being invaded. Oh. And we piled all this money, just poured it out of the cans on the table in front of all the, the people that ran the school and said, why don't you guys go back to class and teach us? That's why we're here. Here's the money. Pay for the damage. Let's get back to work. And then we got out. And I got home that night, and my Roommate said, there's somebody, there's some people outside who want to talk to you. And I said, what do you mean? And I went outside and there was uh, all the made student activists. Uh, where that they built that thing had been a warren of uh, plywood structures where they had the community psychology program, which was actually allowed to give a degree, a bachelor's degree in community psychology. And those groups had brought in all the ethnic minorities from around the Bay Area to study at state under this thing called community psychology. And it was just a hotbed of all the, the radicals on campus. And a few years before I got there, the school had managed to vote and take over the cafeteria and the bookstore. And so all the profits that used to go into some small some company now went into the student union. So they had a big lot of dough to spend on things so that's what they were spending it on was the community psychology program yeah. running, running independent of everything else so but there were all these people out in front of my house i said what and they were saying okay so what are we going to do tomorrow and i says what tomorrow we're the non-organization we don't exist we we did one thing and we quit said, you can't quit so of course you can quit <laughs> it's easy you just quit you know and anyway we are it ended up I became good friends with all these people and moved, we moved in together and we all were part of it. My one roommate, Roger Alvarado, was head of the Third World Liberation Front. And he had a canny appearance to look like Che Guevara. And it didn't, ha didn't hurt that he wore camouflage clothing and a beret when we went to college in my little Volkswagen. It barely fit the two of us in it. And a girl I'd come up from Fresno with... Uh, and Kimura had started this Asian American group that was there. And anyway, it just kind of, we went all on strike and it was the longest student strike in US history. And uh, things, we get flown all over the country to speak about the strike at San Francisco State. Uh -huh. And often the person that I'd have to debate in front of other schools would be my thesis advisor, who was also the head of the psych department. <laughs> he robbed. Was well, because and Berkeley I like him, he liked me, but it just did not sort of lead to what was going to be a, a copacetic uh, agreement on my getting my thesis approved, etc. And over right. half of the people in that program that I was in, those twelve people uh, quit completely, dropped out, and it went from there. So. Okay. Yeah, it, was, it was during the time that I was finishing up at State uh, that I began Last Gasp. Right. So, so Berkeley at the time, Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley was sort of thought of as the hotbed of radicalism, but there was just such a – that same action was happening at San Francisco State and I think is a little less known. Well, it started before Berkeley and it started yeah. before Columbia. Yeah. But Berkeley and Columbia were like the big ace schools, so they got all the credit. Exactly. So, okay. So you came out of that environment. I came out of that school too. It was a lot different when I came out, let me tell you, but you came out of there and you founded Last Gasp and you put out your first comic was Slow Death. And yeah. man, is that a great comic. 
T tell me a little, and, and and soon after that, you also you, you you did "It Ain't Me, Babe," the first comic produced all by women, and it was those two comics that sort of made your name in publishing. Why don't you tell me just a little bit about that era and how you began? Well, um, having been at San Francisco State and getting involved with uh, just about every radical movement that came along, I mean, I I had already my backstory was I'd run my a bunch of friends and I got together. We put out a little newspaper called Flagrante Delecto, underground newspaper in Fresno. It got us into a lot of trouble. And uh, I had exposed a, uh, a DA for being, uh, not that he was gay, but that he was like uh, not prosecuting people that were committing crimes against gay or gay bars that he would go to. <laughs> and uh, my friend Carol Gastanian ran this uh, gay bar in Fresno, and it was anyway. There was a whole bunch of different things that were going on. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, plus I'd been I had already served a couple of years in the Peace Corps. I was one, amongst the first thousand volunteers. Went to Sri Lanka, and when I got back. Uh, at some point, I got hired to work on an India Peace Corps project that, that was being held at Fresno State. And there was another problem because I uncovered corruption there where these evil dentists were filling perfectly good teeth for the five bucks they make off the dental work. And uh, they were hired by their buddy who was this guy that ran the education or the agricultural department. He's one of these guys who would, uh, George Ill, he would never correct you if you called him Dr. Ill, even though he only had a master's in ornamental horticulture. <laughs> Wait, so out of this, in this era, you decided you wanted to publish comics and specifically ecologically themed, an ecologically themed comic that was sort of, in my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was in the vein of like EC horror type comics, twist ending, short stories, anthology format. Is that what you were, was that the inspiration for Slow Death? Yes, well, the cartoonist inspiration for Slow Death was that, for sure. Um, one of the major guys was Greg Irons, and he was a complete EC addict. Uh, so were almost everybody else that was in that comic. Uh, the I had been working at the at Kaiser Hospital doing studies in allergies and emotions at that time. And a colleague of mine, Keith Alward, now Dr. Keith Alward, uh, gave me a, a big fat joint and a copy of the first zap that was out on a New Year's Eve party. And for the first time since I was a kid, just about, I went back into the most greatest reverie I had of my enjoyment of comics. I read and read and read this until dawn, this copy of Zap Comics. And when it came up later, when we were doing, we were doing a lot of work with the United Farm Workers at the time. My girlfriend at the time had been Cesar Chavez's secretary, and we were like doing a lot of, trying to do a lot of things for the farm workers. And one of the guys who had run the Farm workers newspaper, Rod Freeland, was now working at the Berkeley Ecology Center, which was the first ecology center in the country. And we would get together on the weekends with the, the wives and girlfriends and whatnot and hang out. And of course, everything needed money. That was always the, the problem. Everybody needed money. And we said, what can we do to raise money for the ecology center? And we went around and thought of different things. And the thing that struck us the most was the most exotic thing that seemed to capture the most interest of the youngest of the upcoming culture was underground comics. So we thought we'd do an underground comic on ecology. And at some, we tried to figure it out, people, we tried to draw one ourselves and only a couple of people could draw and Nobody could really write stories. And so, well, I guess we're going to have to get the cartoonists to do this. 
So I, I'd already had, met, had known Gary Arlington, and I went to visit him and say, okay, I want to do this, uh, got any ideas who might want to, and he was like the center, the nexus for all the comic book people that seemed to be coming into town every month or two in San Francisco. There'd be a new cartoonist wander in, and they'd all meet up at the comic book store, and it was just a great place to gather. So yeah. Gary Arlington, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Gary Arlington, I just want in case people don't know, is considered to be one of the very first comic book stores ever in the country, right? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. He was, yes. And he was a good friend of yours. You guys used to hang out and you'd read comics and you were into that whole scene. The, the underground cartoonists that were coming into San Francisco were hanging out with, at Gary's store and you. And out of that, you were inspired to publish. You went into, you did Slow Death, but you pulled together just like a murderer's row of amazing cartoonists. And, and like, I don't know how famous, like was Richard Corbin a, a, a household name the way he might be considered uh, today? Jack, Jack Jackson uh, knew about him. A few other people knew about him. I didn't know about him at the time, but he came into it later, I think through the horror comic, and then we got him to do uh, Slow Death and uh, how how he made it in the real world, I think, was this great strip. And it was clever. It was brilliantly drawn, and he used this great airbrush technique. I mean, he's the cover. I think of that was that slow death number four. It's behind you. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll pull that up. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, he just nobody was doing things like this on uh, hardly anywhere. In publishing in America, let alone comics, let alone underground comics. You know, so we kind of like hop, you know, we kind of hopped over the, you know, and so, and to do that. I mean, unprecedented, not just in theme, but much like other underground comics of the time, we're willing to straight up tackle sex, drugs, rock and roll, anything, things that just were not available in any kind of mainstream uh, place well, was, in publishing, was, right? Yeah, well, because we didn't run any advertising, we didn't really have to kiss anybody's ass about that. And Nobody so you, and to make do. up for that, you had to have a higher cover price, right? And, and beyond that, those kind of books are not something that the grocery store is going to carry. That's where people got comics. So how did people buy Last Gasp comics back then? Well, there was a few sto comic stores, uh, but distribution was a, one of those real puzzles. Uh, I, I thought when I avoided the draft for Vietnam that I've got two free years to, you know, to do something. I thought just in the back of my head, I felt like, well, I wonder, I've always wondered about distribution. And then a few years later, that kind of thought came to mind. Well, OK, now I've got to figure out how to do this. I mean, I wasn't planning to get in the comic business. I was planning to do this one book. I went to a bunch of Berkeley drug dealers that I knew and said, what are you doing for your community? Oh, we have this health food store. We have this. And this. Says, no, no. What are you doing for your community? Not now you're filling your pockets with even more money by, you know, <laughs> you know, you know washing your, your filthy funds with. And uh, so I managed to get a loan out of these guys. And... With that loan, I was which I paid back even you know to them. I was able to get the book published, and but then I went out down to the Berkeley Ecology Center with their twenty thousand copies of this comic book, uh, minus the few hundred that we sold on eight campuses on Earth Day. We got the book out in time for the first Earth Day in right. April of uh, nineteen seventy, and. By that time, most of the people who were the real radical people interested in things like underground comics had left. If you could spell the word ecology, you could have gotten a job in Washington, D.C., because that was a big buzzword coming up. Right. Or, or maybe you just got your new hiking boots and your backpack and you went up to the mountains to blow up PG&E towers. You know, that was where the kind of the other side went. Right. And uh, the, you know, the radical ecology people. So uh, they said, gee, that's nice. Uh, this comic is for us. I said, yes. Where do I unload it? I said, uh, well, we have a, our bookstore here, but we'll, we'll take 10 copies for the bookstore. 
They said, no, no, no. You got to take 20,000 copies for the bookstore. And then you pay me back and I pay back the loan. And then you make, you know, the artists have been paid already. You know, you got to pay me back for that. And then, and then you keep all the money after that. You're going to make a lot of money. It's going to help the center. We'll take 10 copies. So I came back to my garage there and I was living in Berkeley then and dumped them all in my garage and figured like, how can I do this? So I went around to print mint and to free and to rip off press and said, uh, will you guys sell my comic for me? And I said, Oh, sure, sure. We'll be happy to do that. Then three months later, I kept coming around saying like they would reorder more. These things would sell and They'd say, well, yeah, I say, well, how about the money for this? And they say, well, we don't have any money. How about take our comics? But you can't sell in all these other bookstores. Oh, that's where you sell them. Okay. And they had all these this list of stores that I couldn't go into because it was their accounts. So it took me a while, but I set up 200 accounts in the Bay Area. I had a, you know, I mean, these things were so interesting. I mean, people can't understand that today because we're battered with, with fancy imagery. But then, I mean, I had, I had several leather stores that were selling. And one was called the Dead Cow. And it had a, sh a shop on Union Street in San Francisco. And they would carry slow death funnies. Uh, beauty parlors would carry slow death funnies. And later on, it ate me big. Health food stores would carry them. Because they were I mean, so are you talking about in San Francisco, or you, or, or, or had you expanded? The Bay area. I had a route. Yeah, Once a month, I would go down to uh, it's it's San Jose, all the way down, little shopping centers all the way down to San Jose from San Francisco, and then back up through Hayward and all through the East Bay, mm -hmm. and back up and up to uh, I could I don't have, I didn't have any in Richmond, but uh, somewhere in. Uh, Oh, I don't know. Well, you know, all these little places. Sure. And sure. then, and then, one by one, I kept getting people, different shops. Also, I, um, my girlfriend had gone to Cuba with a bunch and came back with the weather people. <laughs> the uh, we had to go pick her up in Minnesota because they had to come back through Canada to get back into the U.S. Back then, it was verboten to go to Cuba. And uh, so I loaded up I had a friend who, Randy Tootin, who did posters for Bill Graham. And I loaded up a whole bunch of posters from Bill Graham and boxes and boxes and boxes of comics in my Volkswagen and drove across country. And every time I would stop into some place, whether it was day or night, I would leave a few posters and underground comics out because I know that the kids would grab those as soon right. as they could. And all these, you know, in dumb fuck Nebraska, they'd say, oh my God, look at this. You know, so do it that way. Um, I mean, yeah, even in the Bay Area, those comics were a mind blower to many, right? In, just in San Jose, but you get to Nebraska, you get to the Midwest, that's got to be something like stuff that they just never could have or would have encountered. Exactly. Um, but and even, speak, but even yeah. then, you have to remember that people like uh, Richard Corbin, right out of Kansas City, there on the right state well, line. So, at that same, around that same time, right after Slow Death Number One, I guess you published um, "It Ain't Me, Babe." And I want to put this picture up for a second because I I meant to show this in my opening slideshow, but I didn't have a chance because I think this was a pretty important comic. "It Ain't Me, Babe" was the first comic published entirely produced and published entirely by women, not published, but produced entirely by women. Is that right? That's um, right. Trina Robbins. Trina Robbins. Yeah. Uh, I, forget, one, I don't know if she called me. I mean, there was a couple of women in, in Slow Death Number One. Uh, but then, so I've been talking with Trina, and uh, she said, like, I don't know if she called me. I can't remember now, but I think she called me. He said, I want to do it. I want to do a comic book, an all women's comic. And I, I said, so do I. And so she said, well, and she was, I think she was going to try to sell that to print mint, but I, I made a beeline over to her house and she was holding Casey, who's now 40, so has a, has a daughter of her own. And uh, 
uh, I handed her a thousand dollars. She handed me the artwork, and <laughs> we did the comic book. And the title "It Ain't Me, Babe." There was a women's newspaper in Berkeley called "It Ain't Me, Babe," and Trina did a strip on the back of that newspaper called "Belinda Berkeley." I think it was. So, so you mentioned print mint and and rip off press, and um, for a second, touch on it because that's like. Last Gas, Print Mint, Rip Off, those seem to me to be the big three altern, uh, uh, underground publishers. Well, there, Tell there, me was, there was Company and Sons also. I'm not for, who I'm not familiar with. In fact, Print Mint, outside of Zap, I'm not really familiar with the titles. I'm not an expert in underground comics, and it's hard to be one because it's really hard to find some of this stuff. Much of it has never been reprinted in trade paperback form. Granted, you kept a lot of this stuff in print for many years in single-issue format. Um Tell me a little bit, though, about your distinguished competition at that time, Print Mint, print, print mint Rip Off Press. Just, just a, a, a note about, like, what that scene was like. Were you guys enemies? Were you friends? What was what was going on? I'd say more frenemies. Right? If anything. I, I, there's, like, a, I, somewhere I've got a, a beautiful thing I really love is a hand-drawn challenge for a football game from Rip Off Press to Last Guest. And at the time, I had uh, Terry Zwickoff, who's the movie director, yeah. and he was my first employee. So um, mm. I didn't know that. That's that's so, really interesting. <laughs> and uh, and his cousin Sherwin, and they were like saying, like they want us to play football. These are kind of small guys, and. Uh, <laughs> football or baseball, something, I don't know, they want right. I will, I'll take a shotgun, I'll show the motherfucker. <laughs> so I, you know, it was, uh, uh, I think I think we're all pretty good friends, I don't know, uh, Bob, Re Bob and Peggy Rita had worked at the print mint when it was the major poster shop on 8th Street during uh, 67, 66, 67. And Don and Alice Shanker had set that up. They had a framing shop up on Telegraph Avenue next to Moe's Books and Moe Moskowitz and Don Shanker. Uh, Moe, I think, lent Don the money to start Printment, the publishing thing. And Don was a good comics. He knew a lot about comics, the old school stuff. And he, he started a tabloid newspaper called Yellow Dog. And that progressed after about 10 or 12 issues into a comic book itself and went on for, I don't know, maybe up to 20 issues or so. I don't know. Uh -huh. um, that one I've heard of, but I don't think I've ever seen a copy of, to tell you the truth. I don't think I've held one in my hands anyway. Oh, you should get hold of your buddy Beer Bomb. He knows all about that stuff. <laughs> so, but we're interesting you bring up Bob Beer Bomb. Uh, he's often said that it was print mint, and the whole scene that you guys did, uh, uh, distributing, running your own show, selling direct to stores, that was as much, if not more, of an influence in the foundation of what we now know as the direct market for non-returnable comic book periodicals. Exactly. Yeah. Any thought? Are you any thoughts on that, or would you just say that nailed it? Is there? Do you want well, to expand well, on that? At all? That information is backed a little bit. We didn't call it the direct market because the direct market hadn't been created yet. Right. Uh, so uh, that would there was a guy named Phil Suling in New York, and Phil was a was a I think middle school teacher, and he had a second Sunday event where everybody would show up and sell things in this hotel lobby, whatever it was and comic books and whatnot. Well, at one point, Zap number four came out from Printment, and this is a comic that got everybody in trouble. And somebody, some policeman busted them for sell, having this comic being sold at that event. This and, is the famous incest issue. Uh, yeah, I think it had uh, Joe Blow and his family. Yeah. Yes. From a draw on this complete parody of you know, the ideal American family, but they were all, everybody was screwing everybody else, mom and dad and son and, you know, sis and Bob and junior, whatever. So even the cat and the dog were screwing each other, I think, of the strip. 
And, uh, and it was a parody on American values, you know, but it was before the Supreme Court had ruled on that parody was okay. Okay, well, so, I'm glad you so, brought so that up. So Suling yeah. lost his job over this. Yeah. And was, you know, kind of bitter. Mike Friedrich had been producing some comic books that weren't undergrounds, and they weren't straight comics. Uh, we call them ground level comics. And we were distributing some of those, and he would always come around asking questions. Eventually, he went to work, he went to Marvel and convinced them that they could sell more money, they'd make as much money, if not more, selling directly, getting no returns, and being able to adjust their print runs based on that. And so, and I just very, very quickly, I'm sorry, Ron. I just, for our audience, I just oh. really quickly want to say up until that time, comics were distributed via the newsstands. They would have to be, have their covers stripped and returned. There was a lot of waste built into the system. There was a lot of overprinting and returns and shipping costs and labor that the direct market was deemed as sort of a solution to that. We would give you your orders up front. You'd print to order. There'd be no returns and no waste. So that's the situation Phil Suling bought into that. But you guys were doing it at the same time, right? Correct? We were doing it before then. Before then. Right. But, and so... But, but that kind yeah, of distribution that Mike learned from the way that we did business is what he took to Marvel. And that's how that got generated down the line. Right. And I was looking at, you, you mentioned Star Reach, and I looked up Mike Friedrich and, and Star Reach a second ago. That was a comic that, that that he had produced. And you can just see the influence. If you look into that stuff, you'll see the influence on Marvel in that era, in the comics they produced and everything else. It's just unmistakable. You could see that guy had a had an impact there. And, um, and Mike, Mike married Lee Mars, who was one of the first women cartoonists. And she uh -huh. did Pudge the Girl Blimp. I didn't know that. Characters, yeah. And she also okay. did a, a book on farting and uh, some other things. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned a second ago about parody in the Supreme Court. So let's go back in time one more time, back to 1971, when Last Gasp also published the Air Pirate Funnies. Tell me that, yeah. a little bit about that. You were involved. They, they did a parody of Mickey Mouse they got sued by Disney kind of intentionally. He wanted to get sued by Disney and made a, made a huge case out of it. T tell us how you were involved with that. And how did you get out unscathed? Well, <laughs> uh, the country was in probably kind of a similar feeling about the Vietnam war around the same time, 71 is an uh, awful lot like uh, it was a few years ago with the. You, know, you notice that we haven't had a lot of a lot of stuff about Afghanistan or Iraq lately, you know. Whatever yeah, I guess there's nothing that. going on over there. I guess everything's okay over there. Huh? Nothing going on over there, but we're just you know, the news has been turned down. So. And uh, so the. I had uh, become friends with Dan O'Neill, who was a cartoonist for the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. He did a strip called Odd Bodkins, and he would get all kinds of pot jokes in there about his two little characters were always uh, making eating magic cookies and going tripping around. And so Dan was, a, was an interesting guy. He was playing banjo in, a, in the Red Garter up on Broadway, so he was hooked into a lot of different groups. And in 1969, the Mitchell brothers had started up the, uh, the porn the movie, porno theater. Porn movie, porn movie porno. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I started in 1970 or 69, 70. I mean, we had our first meetings in 69. But it didn't publish till April of 70. And somewhere along the line, I ran into O'Neill and we became friends. We hung out with the Mitchell brothers and so um, they were great supporters of all this stuff. And Dan kept, he had his own uh, comic book, Dan O'Neill Comics, come out from Company and Sons. That was the fourth big comic company here. It would, they were the original publisher of Young Lust, for instance. They had, you know, they had good taste. They also had their own big uh, 
big 36 inch press that they could do covers on themselves. They were printers also. And Don, uh, John Bagley was the guy that was running it. And his partner took off from here, went back and went to work for Texas Monthly Magazine, Texas. So he, Bagley was left with all that stuff. Um, and so Dan, so, though, I'm sorry. Cover was yeah, printed on Bagley's press. So in any case, O'Neill was always getting loaded and talking about how much he hated Disney and how Disney had gotten into his mind and everything. So he, he wanted to do this uh, comic book, uh, an anti-Disney comic book. And he managed to scrape together by going to various festivals and things, uh, Bobby London, Gary Halgren, and Ted Richards, who formed the Air Pirates. They were all, and he came back to, into San Francisco with them. And they all set about to draw this thing. Well, I had agreed with Dan that I would publish it, but my uh, my main agreement with him was that I'd publish it, but he couldn't say who was publishing it because I knew it was going to get busted. All my lawyer friends said, you guys are going to get popped by the third book. Well, had Dan ever delivered the third book that he was paid for, <laughs> it would have been the third book. But we got two out anyway before we got busted. And, and the third was confiscated, right? I believe it was produced, no, but it was never done. Oh, okay. Well, Got it. The first and the second were confiscated. The big skids of, of books went off to the Disney trash pile. Well, so, so his stated goal, though, was to get this to the Supreme Court and go all the way and make him put him in jail if he didn't stop doing uh, it. Fortunately for the guys, they had a lot of people that wanted to take the case. They had the law firm of uh, Terry Hallinan and Michael Stepanian. Uh, and they took over and kept they kept winning and winning and winning. And they got up to the Supreme Court before they lost. Well, as soon as they lost, and at that point I had not been mentioned by it, which would have been wonderful publicity. Um, as soon as we lost their attorney said, well, you, you can't pay this three quarter of a million dollar fine. You can't even pay us. So rat out Turner. <laughs> so they ratted me out. <laughs> so suddenly I, so suddenly I'm fit. I'm fit, I remember going to the Al, this Alcoa building and the elevator opened up into their offices. You know, most places you open up into a, an aisle and then you find your office, you're going this opened right into the this whole floor of attorneys. And that was just a wonderful, we had a wonderful time there. I uh, kind of played the, I don't know, man, I'm just another hippie, you know. Where'd your money come from? Well, you know, we had like a Kiva, dude, you know, like people would contribute to the Kiva what you could and then what you needed you took out. Well, who was money's was it? I don't know, just good people. You know, so we went on like that. My shin was so was dented by my lawyer kicking me under the table while I was giving this transcript. Um, and I remember like, talking about you, the, you know the LSD is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. And after that, none of them brought their coffee to the table. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. So um, we finally settled. Disney finally settled. Realizing they weren't going to get any money out of me, uh, for we signed a secret covenant that for ten years I could not do anything anti-Disney because they knew that their copyright was coming to an end in a few years, and everybody was like trying to like get ready to start publishing all that old Disney stuff that then would be in public domain. Right. Well, they they managed to lobby the the government, and so they copyright laws got changed several times now since then. It's yes. almost like it's going to go forever. Of course. So, um, There's too uh, much money there, right? They're not going to let go. They, they agreed not to collect any money from me if I would not do anything against Disney for 10 years. I mean, I thought, like, what? I, why would I do anything against Disney? This is stupid. 
you know, but they, that was their whole sense. And but for doing that, so we each had to pay our own court costs. But they got to say that they got three quarters of a million dollars from me as to deter anybody else from doing what I did. Yeah. So, to, to, uh, to tell you the truth, the comic book publishing company on it was uh, the guys thought it was funny to put hell comics on there. You know, if you want more stuff like this, you can go to hell. Well, I, to tell you the truth, don't you think that if it ha that Disney was only willing to settle because they really thought if it, they took it all the way, they would lose that case? No, we, I don't, we already lost it. No, the reason I was talking that we had already lost the case. But the, but if they settled because they knew they weren't going to get any money, so they just basically agreed to call it a, kind of a wash if you agreed not to do any more, to produce any more stuff. I think that they were baffled by everything. They, I mean, they're really, these guys are like, it was like going into a room full of cardboard, you know, cereal boxes. Right. You know? Hi, I'm a box of cornflakes. <laughs> so you got out of Air Pirates, you made it out, you had produced, then you went into a bunch of stuff. Then you became a publisher proper. I'm going to just go through a bunch of titles real quick and we can go back and we'll talk about it for a second. I just want to show them on the screen women's comics came out of ain't it me babe an anthology all produced by women there were some amazing um female cartoonists involved with that um you did a book called armageddon which we'll come back to which is just one i've never read or even seen but the description is one of the craziest things i've ever seen a really cool one to me was anarchy comics so um I, let's go up to this period, right? Because this to me marks sort of uh, up through 78 is sort of a period to me that I would like to discuss. So you did women's comics and Armageddon. Tell me a little bit first about women's comics, about how that came about and like what it meant. Okay. Do you want me to talk over the slideshow? I don't really have the slideshow of all the women's comics. I only had that one slide, but I wanted to bring up some of the cartoonists um, in there, besides Trina Robbins, names people might know, Melinda Gebby, uh, Phoebe Glockner, Roberta Gregory, uh, 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 Carol Lay, and a bunch of other, a bunch of other great cartoonists. Those are just a few that pop out at me. Um, and, and really produced some interesting stuff. There weren't a lot of female cartoonists at all. This was a book now that was all female cartoonists. How did that book sell for you? And what was the, um, was it selling well, more to, to we, went a, we went into a second printing on the, it ain't me babe and sold through. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the women's okay. On the front is the, uh, Trina's comic of It Ain't Me, Babe, is, uh, to me, my personal joy in that was it contained the artwork of Harvey Kurtzman's daughter. Oh. So that was, I felt you know, really, you know, sort of like very happy about that. Just a personal joy of having some connection to Harvey Kurtzman. And you know, that was nice. And the women's comics cover was done by Pat Moody, and she just passed away about a year ago. And she'd become a, a really good uh, bass guitarist and played in a lot of bands around. And uh, But each women's comics had a, uh, a, a different kind of theme and a different editor. So every, all the women got the practice of being an editor of a comic book because basically it was a totally male world and it was just really unfair to you know, here's half the population, thus half the intelligence, maybe even more intelligence. I think women are maybe. smarter than men. Maybe. And, uh, and you know, the, and the, the way that they looked at things and how they brought things up, and we're still, as a culture, trying to figure out, you know, uh, what do we do, you know, what's going to happen with women now that they, you know, for, you know, managed to get their you know, right to vote for them. <laughs> Well, what are we going to do with the yeah. pesky ladies? No, but it's it's true. So it's the, if you look at everything, there's nothing but old white men running it. Who needs and that? Still, and still to this most to this day, mostly right. Still true. Um, it's still true, and it's awful. Oh, Jesus. Okay, Todd, just tell me tell me about Armageddon. 
Armageddon. Okay, there was a guy named... Uh, when, you, when you're publishing all this odd stuff, even though you might be across the aisle from where your political feelings lie, you still see the reality of it being able to be a get out there and to the public and let the public decide what's up. And Barney Steele came to be with his comic Armageddon. Barney was an interesting cat. He was a, uh, a Navy SEAL. And uh, he told me a lot of things that the this, this SEALs do that's just phenomenal. Like, you know, you get dumped into the ocean from an aircraft at night. And you uh, swim to shore eight miles to some beach yeah. somewhere, yeah. and you got your forty-pound backpack, and you have to find your buddy that's got a forty-pound backpack, and you assemble it, and then you have a working atomic bomb, you know, things like that. <laughs> so Barney is like, uh, so he's, you know, nothing phases him at all. He's really, and I used to go out, and it was really a lot of fun because we'd go out and get drunk together, and, uh, hang out with a lot of his other ex-seal buddies. It was a rough crew. It was very interesting. And um, <laughs> so. Uh, so he was a cartoonist. They were, they were right? also libertarians. Yeah. And there was this network of libertarian people in San Francisco. There was like this hot dog stand that would only take silver coins back then in the 70s. So you could still fish out, get a handful of change. You could still find some silver in it in 72, 73. And. Uh, so it was just these kind of like almost comic, humorous personalities that would kind of bump around. And then th these guys would like, you know, wander in and bump into the guys who were into anarchists. And they'd bump into the guys who were like more into like the, you know, tutti frutti uh, uh, LSD people, you know, I mean, what a bunch. And Barney got a studio down the street from me at last guest on Folsom Street, upstairs from a, a, a company that made kimchi, a Korean company that made kimchi. They had big, big vats of, of rotting cabbage. Right. And in between it, he'd have his drawing table. He got really cheap space to rent out the space between vats of rotting cabbage. <laughs> And so he drew, though, he used that space to draw what is described as a crazy comic about race relations, about a, a black man marrying a white woman and a white man marrying a, a black woman and how both are racist. And it, it came from like an objectivism standpoint, but like a, a left-leaning libertarianism. Is that how you would describe it or would you just describe it as nuts? You described it much better than I could. That's good. Yeah. And I haven't even read it. So this is just what I can't wait to read it. I'm looking for that one. But that one led into one that I did read. Uh, re that I picked up the, uh, the collection of Anarchy Comics. And this stuff is blowing my mind how good these comics are. This should be like a handbook for anybody who calls themselves an anarchist. Today, they got if they got to read this. It was such an well, introduction. Well, Jay Kenny and Paul Mavridis are really good thinkers. And they're also excellent artists. And Mavridis also had inked the Freak Brothers for a long time for Gilbert yes. Shelton. Yes. So he had, he had that in his pocket. And uh, Jay Kenny had his own magazine called Gnosis for 20 years or so. so Jay, Jay, guys, Jay Kenny, right? Jay Kenny, yeah. I can't quite see that, but the. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the anthology I didn't publish, but I did publish the five comics that were that made up the anthology. And man, there are some excellent, excellent stories in there. I went through and read it, and I, I think Mavrides is one of the uh, 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 lesser uh, renowned guys. I think he's a genius. I think the stuff that he did on I love the Freak Brothers, but I thought the stuff that he did, the Freaks Abroad stuff that he did was like took it to a whole other level. I would love to have him oh, on the show. Yeah. And and his ideas and what I love the most about this is this is not a preachy book that's telling you this anarchy is the way or this is one way. There are conflicting schools of thought. There's like am are we even right in what we're doing? There's parody of itself. T t talk a little bit if you can about the, the contents of this. Um 
if you even remember what from back from when you when you published it for sure but like generally speaking that conflicting nature do you know do, do you know who margaret mead was i yes i know the name she was an anthropologist who studied yeah. uh, the sexual behavior of the samoans yes whatever and uh a friend of mine, Alan Button, uh, uh, Dr. Alan Button was a psychologist and he knew Margaret and he told me the story one time of being at a cocktail party with her. And she sat down, kind of big frumpy chair and she was kind of a big frumpy woman. And she had kind of like a flower print dress and she had her, her double uh, scotch soda in her hand. And immediately everybody started pestering her about like, well, what was it like, and blah, 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 this and that, you know, about her her career and she says when i was writing fucking in the philippines or whatever you want to call it and um it's kind of a same way when those guys were doing that strip uh the anarchist is always you know my in my personal perception where the guys always depicted as holding the big uh uh circular bomb black bomb with a fuse in it sure and uh, I don't think that until Anarchy Comics came along that anybody had a fair shake about what anarchy really was. And, and so that was kind of the, the brilliance of it was the educational aspects where they could explain in your terms what was going on in terms of you versus the government versus uh, the society. And yeah and how they're all supposed to work together. And the it's historical the, context, too, that it provides in showing history of, of anarchism in other countries, as well as, like, looks into the potential future. Like, when the anarchist punk from today gets frozen and reincarnated in the, in the far techno future, it seems to be an indictment of... Um, not not just like right wing politics, but actually like left wing kind of mainstream technocracy type concepts. You, is am I reading too much into that? Not at all. Um, t talk about that if you will. How do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel about that? How do you like? Okay, man, you're from the '60s. You're from the counterculture in San Francisco. What are you, Ron? I don't know. How do you describe yourself politically? Are you an old hippie? What? Well, how do you? How, what do you? How do you? Describe yourself. I could be an old hippie. Um, my ho I have a hobby that is is politics. Politics is my hobby. So um, I enjoy watching politicians and seeing what they do and how they do it. It's you know very fascinating to me. Um, I I don't know what am I. I think of myself as I. I think when my was being more of a parent, I was a good parent. Um, try to treat my employees fairly. I don't know. I just try to be a good guy. I like to help people. Yeah. Always am helping people. I don't know. All right. Yeah. To me, that's a, that's enough, man. That's like that's more than ninety percent of the people out there. So let's keep no, talking no, about. It's not true. It's not true. It's, no. People are people are basically good. Okay, well, let's talk. Let's talk comics. So now after Anarchy Comics, I'm going to skip a few because there's so many things that you published. I'm going to skip to some of the ones that are maybe well known. We'll, we'll talk about this in a second. I'll throw this up first because you start. Our, Robert Crumb brought Weirdo to you. Can you just tell me how it, how that started? How Was this the first Crumb project outside of like some of his strips that he contributed to the other anthologies, like Crumb produced project that you had at last gas yeah he well robert was in our first uh comic slow death right two -page story and gilbert sheldon gave us two you know gave us two pages in there also so uh, i was very happy with that i think that kind of made the you know actually made it because he was you know instantly saw that it was part of the the gang the group or whatever uh, instant, followed, instant underground cred, right? When you got Crumb in your anthology. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Robert was just always just so amazing with his his uh, things. He, I remember 
he brought that book to us. Um, I I don't know whether he shopped it around before or not, or what you know what happened. But uh, he had he had odd things in it, you know, like the the uh, the photo funnies. Yeah, the Fumetti. He, he wanted he really liked the old girly magazines, and he tried to make it like a, a '30s kind of. Uh, Mag, a very entertaining thing that people would, you know, didn't have much any money for entertainment, but they could afford a, a little pulpy thing to take home and read through a few times and reuse it a few times. And it's a, you know, it's economically successful that way. So, yeah, so we did it, and he just would every now and then would show up with a new issue, and you know, we uh, one of the things that I. I I think set our company apart from others was that I used to pay all the royalties in advance for the entire print run. So we would assume we we're going to sell out. Didn't always work that way. There were some few duds here and there. And so you got already got burnt because you already paid for the, the printing of the whole thing and the royalties of the whole thing and having right. to dump half of the run was sad and costly. Because you have to pay, you have to sell through about 75 percent 80 percent before you get close to profit and then it's amortized over all that time that it sat there taking up space in the warehouse so it's not a lot so, of bizarre kids don't go into the comic business <laughs> well so it's interesting though that you bring up crumbs thoughts on weirdo being like disposable kind of cheap entertainment because that's how I view kind of the underground books that you produced and those other companies produced of the time. Yet here we are 40, 50, whatever years later. And now that stuff, man, if you want to get it, you got to get these hardcover art book collections. This is not the new weirdo book that you guys put out this year, which was not a collection of comics, right? It was more about the history of the comic. Yeah, there's, there's a, we have a whole hardcover of Crumb's work that's in weirdo. That's what I'm holding right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. This uh, is well, out of print. And Joe Matt, the famous cartoonist, told me to tell Ron Turner to put this back in print because this goes for like 170 bucks on, on eBay right now. Oh, I have to sell my copy then. Get on that, Ron. <laughs> so Crumb brought Weirdo to you. That was great. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about that because I'm really interested in when it went to Peter Bag and how it sort of changed it at that time. But first... It's not long after that, another underground comic that people might have heard of came over to Last Gasp, right? Zap, I believe number 10 was your first issue. Maybe it was number 11. Maybe I messed well, that up. It started, actually, it started in the mid-70s, about 75, 76. Crumb had a problem getting uh, the money that was due him from his then-publisher, Printman. Okay. And so he, he told me about that. But since he had added other people to the Zap crew, the only two books were his were Zap Zero and Zap One. So uh, I took over those and began selling them. And then Printment and I had entered into an agreement where one oh, of us right. would pay for the royalties and one would pay for the printer. And we split the press runs. Right. So, so you did the reprints of the early issues that pr that Print Mint had done the first printings of. Yes. So so we started reprinting some of those. Uh, what, the Zap guy said, okay, can you do this for us too? And so unfortunately for Print Mint, we they exited Print Mint, but fortunately for me, they came to last guest. Right. And so uh, later on, you would produce Hup by Crumb as well oh, right yes. the, up two three four which are probably like some of my favorite all-time favorite crumb well, comics yeah, we, we want to we're supposed to have uh we probably would be doing it now if it hadn't been for this damn virus but uh we're doing the anthology of hub okay i gotta have that yeah, speaking of it's, which got, it's got crumb in there i mean it's got uh trump right yes the donald it's, trump story is it's so great. It's such a great story. I, I've, I've read it a hundred times and, and I will buy that hardcover. Speaking of which, let's do a quick plug 
Now, since we already talked about Slow Death, there's a Slow Death anthology coming out later this year that I can't wait. I've got this copy. Yes, that was uh, what happened there. You'll see if you turn to the uh, title page, yeah. there, you'll see that it's done by uh, Wingbow Press and Last Guest. And so the combined name is Wingnut. Yeah. You know, and Wingbow that- Press was the publishing arm of Book People which is the first big alternative uh, distributor for the straight book world. So this was 1975 you put out this trade paperback? Yes. It was $5. That's got a $5 cover price. I know. I know. And this is out of print and really hard to find. This well, this is, was 50 bucks on Amazon. If I, This is my copy that I found in a used bookstore somewhere. And my daughter, it was in mint condition. My daughter bent the cover. Oh, wow. She took the cover out? Yeah, you know, I thought she would enjoy it. She's four, so I thought it was about time to expose her to slow death. And, and you know, she didn't take care of it the way that I thought My she should. My son, who runs Last Guest now, pretty much, I, I do very little uh, column. When he was like about somewhere between six and nine, uh, I came home one day and he's sitting on the couch and he's got a copy of Weirdo in his hands. He's looking at Weirdo. Yeah. And I think like, hey, if I say something, it might mar him to the point that he's going to, you know, be, influ- I want him to be influenced by whatever. I don't want to, you know, this is a, this is a critical moment, you know. With the, yeah, right. So, uh, you know, you make a big fuss about something or tear it out of their hands and, you know, it's, it could go any which way after that. So I just didn't say much. I just kept my eye on him out of the corner of my eye. And at some point, he got this big frown on his face, and he closed it up, and he put it down, and turned on the TV. You know, it was perfect. So, uh, but yeah, I understand that. But in there, you wouldn't want her to look in the back of that issue. Have you seen everybody sell portraits uh-uh. in the back of the slow, the slow death anthology you have there? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yes, 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 yes. They're great. Well, oh, the self portraits. Oh yeah, I got to show one. I got to show the Rand Holmes. One, yeah. one, if you guys remember, not for kids, guys. Not for kids, no. Not so for Rand, kids. Rand is bisexual. And, oh. Um, oh, okay. okay. Makes more sense. He had gotten in a big fight with his girlfriend about 72, 73, somewhere like that. Anyway, he came down and, and lived with me for about six months from Canada. And uh, it was just a brilliant, I could, it was so I'm so happy for that to happen because I got to watch him grow all the time. And he was a very smart, all these cartoons are very smart. Yeah. And um, creative. So, so all right. Yeah. You got, I got one more. What other book that stood out among them? <laughs> and I'm going to make a guess. I don't know if this is right. I'm going to say this is probably one of your better, one of the best selling comics from Last Gasp of all time. But I don't know. Tell me about Cherry Pop Tart because this was. My first exposure probably to pornography from that I bought at the comic book store that I worked. Actually, I think I shoplifted it maybe or, or put the money in the register and took it home. Yes. And I probably jerked off to it. Um, but it was not until later years reading it. And I'm like, man, this is some solid cartooning and funny stuff. Great stories. It wasn't just pornography. Or, or, or I mean, I don't know. Tell me your, tell me your feeling. And, and I know there were legal wranglings. It's no longer known as Cherry Pop-Tart. Tell us about Cherry and Cherry Pop-Tarters for a second. Okay, well, uh, first I'll tell you about Larry Wells. And Larry was uh, one of the earliest underground cartoonists. He had a whole, he had a series of three comics from Britain called Captain Guts, which was like a, uh, a blonde, you know, flat-topped superhero guy called Captain Guts. It was like a complete parody of the American superhero. And he had other strips as well. And uh, at some point, he, uh, I think we did American Flyer comics was one of his. And so he was a real player amongst all the cartoonists, but he was from Bakersfield. And so there was another cartoonist named Larry Sutherland, who was also from Bakersfield. (coughs) Excuse me. And my, I had Bakersfield 
connections. My father had been a country and western disc jockey in Bakersfield. <laughs> so he had a, he was known there as Tumbleweed Turner. He had several careers. That was one one career he had. Okay. And uh, so Bakersfield was a particularly foul place in terms of cultural inadequacies. Okay. And Larry Sutherland, and so there were all these, there was uh, Big Apple comics and Motor City comics and LA comics and San Francisco comics. You know, and all these places were go coming up and, and I felt like, this is bullshit. Let's do it. So I got together with those guys and I said, let's do a Bakersfield com comics. So we did Bakersfield Country Comics. Larry did a great big Peter Bilt sitting out in a, a truck stop in Bakersfield. It was perfect for the cover. And we just used those cartoonists from Bakersfield to do it. And one of those strips was Cherry Pop-Tart. And uh, when we, things were getting a little tight, so we made sure in other issues that she was not no longer in high school. She was in junior college. Junior <laughs> college, right. I remember. It makes sure that she was at least 18 years old. You know? I, loved, and, uh, I loved that she went to junior college, but I don't know why, but I love that. <laughs> well, that's, that's where we all went. I spent three years at Fresno City College. Right. So um, playing football, wrestling, and uh, going down the most grade points of any student in California. So, And uh, so but, essentially, though, it was an Archie parody, so, right? So Cherry started up, and then Larry wanted to do a whole issue of Cherry. Which is fine, and we did. I don't know, twenty issues. I don't know, but then at some point he uh, took it over to Kitchen Sink, and uh, for reasons never completely explained to me. But uh, in any case, uh, things happen, and he. I remember one time he and his wife had gotten into some problems up in Santa Rosa with their kids or whatever, and I remember that paying them anyway, even though they were able to do, you know, give any, any work for it because they were, they had too many hassles in their home life okay. to do any work at that time. So same thing with crumbs. I used to give them an extra thousand dollars a month for a long time, figuring that it's kind of like banking it so that at some point I can do something uh, we could do some big thing, you know, cash in there, but they needed the money because Robert had gone through a divorce and he, uh, he had to come up with a lot of dough for the, uh, for the divorce. So anyway, it was odd. Um, but so Cherry Pop Tart, how, 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 how big of a hit was Cherry Pop? This is what I want to know. Like, how, was that a monster? Oh, I, think was, I, think was, I think it was brilliant. Uh, it was just, we just continued to print them and reprint them and reprint yeah. them. Yeah. Nobody, you know, it was fabulous. Any idea like how many number ones in all the printings, like what the numbers would add? I'm just curious what the print one would have been like. Oh, they were usually 10,000 copies, I think, at a time. And, I, and how many printings would you say the number one went through? I just have a, no idea. I'd have to go back and look. Okay. That's, that's been 40 years ago. I don't know. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm obsessing on this because that was one book that just was, it struck me, it was an Archie parody in, in, in one way. And then I know that there was, was it Nabisco sued because of the use of the name Pop-Tart in the early issues? And uh, and, and that I mean, had to be removed? I think it was something else. Who read the pop, pop I forget. Tart. Yeah, Kellogg's, Kellogg's, I, or whoever. I wrote one of the best letters of my life uh, to these guys. So for one thing, they didn't have a cherry pop tart available. Right. And uh, sec you know, and secondly, <laughs> oh wait, there was like a whole thing. I, I just, it was, you know, so I'd be more than happy to, you know, have a wonderful, big, very, very popular court case about this. You know, just right. With all the publicity and everything, and everything. And they they finally gave up, went away. All, all right. right. You know, it, it it makes your you know it makes your uh, sphincter pucker. You know, when you get letters from these big corporations. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, I'd already I'd already gone through that with. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be terrifying, right? Because one of those companies, what they can afford to spend on a legal case against a guy like you, 
could really destroy your business and maybe even your life, right? I mean, or make me successful, <laughs> or or do the opposite, right? There used to be a phrase that you know, I remember back in the fifties, there was a phrase that went something like, uh, you know, uh, two fires and a bankruptcy will make you rich in California." <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so around 2016, last gas distribution folded. I read some articles about that. Mostly, you know, margins were thinner. We talked about this in the green room. A lot of competition from other distributors picking up on your counterculture vibe. Basically, it was Amazon yeah. and, the, and the consolidation of, uh, of distributions. And also, there was the rise of the publisher representatives who would represent, you know, groups who would represent publishers, mostly the small independent ones. And how they survived was that they get whatever new publishers they get, they put their front list up and sell the hell out of it. And you'd be so happy because you'd sell maybe five, six times as much books as you would sell all at once. But then they'd get the next groups coming in to join them. Some of these publisher group, rep groups now have two or 300 publishers that they represent. And how can you deal with all of those publishers? You can't, you get the front list, you sell that. So the, sell, the sales uh, time that used to be like, when I first started doing trade paperbacks uh, into the book trade, the you could have two or three years worth of sales, no problem. That, that's been shrunk to less than six months now. If you don't get your money out in six months, you ain't going to see it. Interesting. Because there's all the new stuff shoving in there. They got to make space. You don't get in there anymore. The channel's overstuffed with books. Is that what's going on? Well, there's, what, there's 16,000 publishers. I don't know. Plus, now you can anybody can be a publisher. That's right. Okay, so you guys kept publishing. You're still publishing. You the, published the big book of Weirdo last year. But then you've also done something that I've seen other comics companies like publishers like Fantagraphics and maybe some others do. You, you you dipped into crowdfunding. Tell tell us about that, Ron. How's that? How oh, that was wonderful. We uh, were getting to really a tight spot uh, because the sales were going down, stores were closing, populations were changing, appetites were changing, and we wanted to come up with some things and this concept of crowdfunding came about and that was a, it's a, it was a great idea everybody gets to be part of it you could you know you don't actually have to be begging you can you know somebody's going to get a a copy of something for it it's just that you're just going to get your money there first for these things to pay for them so it's kind of brilliant so we did a number of those my son colin turner handled that and he uh, you know did very i think he did very well with that we got our our money and we got things printed and we got them out and kept kept the things rolling yeah are you still doing it oh uh, we haven't done a fundraiser for a while but we should yeah we may, we may have to now that you know with all this uh, lack of being able we sell our mail orders picked up quite a bit Just what about but well, we were closed down for a while anyway with the uh, yeah well Ron, you've we've talked a lot, a lot of stuff here tonight. I, I think I've asked a lot of questions and you've answered them all. I want to open it up now. You don't even have to look, but I'm going to turn on the setting where you could see the viewer comments if you want. And if anybody from the audience has any questions that they want, uh, now would be your time. I'm going to start looking at the chat a little bit more. I'm not going to go up through all the chats. I kind of threw up a few things. Um, uh, you know, so so. Ron, let's talk while if we're waiting, we'll see if any questions pop up. We're like, we got about 25 people watching live right now, but we'll have more people watching this o over time. Um, it's, tell me a little bit. So we got a Freak Brothers cartoon that's about to hit. Okay. Um, this underground stuff, the underground stuff, I think, has moved more and more into the mainstream and, and even more, like we talked about. The, originally, when this stuff came out, it was very accessible, kind of cheap entertainment. You could fold it up, back pocket, all that stuff. Now we're into hard covers. If I want to get Zap Comics right now, I can buy a five hundred dollar hardcover set from Fanagraph. I ha I bought it, and uh, 
But I, when I got it, I was like, I don't like reading it as much this way. I would really rather buy like all the Zap issues still. Are they all still available through Last Gas? Can we go to your website? No, check no. Them? We're down to like four or five issues, I think, now. Any, any thoughts about keeping the floppy issues in print and available? It's just that it's, if we had some access to some cheap printing, sure, but we don't. Yeah. Yeah, you have to do a, a very large printing to of of comic books to get them. Okay. This this is one of those things that would be one of my suggestions is that a crowdfunding for something like that, I w seems realistic and man, I'd support it. I I've got the hard covers, but I want those issues. I want that feel. I want those back covers and the staple. I want all that stuff. Um, here we go. Uh here from uh, weird dad. I appreciate the work you've done and still do never say die, Ron. I'm going to go back through some of these comments that I've got up here. A uh, cherry is apparently being published again. Pretty sure we saw newer issues at the big apple Christmas con in December. You still got yeah, the rights. Yeah, to uh, got some coming out. Yes, he does. And, uh, Larry said, uh, you know, he's still working, still doing it. It's great strip. Oh, Okay, so tell us about what we're going to see in the new Slow Death, the new Slow Death collection that's coming out, I think in November, right? What's what's the extra material? or Because this collection only did, I think, through issue four or five, and I believe there were, what, seven issues altogether? Are... There were 11 issues of Slow Death Funnies. Oh, 11. So there's a bunch I've never even seen. Right. And it, virtually, virtually each issue was kind of on a subject. Like uh, we had a cancer issue, uh -huh. we had a war issue. Uh, you know, if, if you look on the front cover of that uh, Slow Death Zero, you'll see a, a it, it's also on Slow Death number seven. Bill Stout did the cover on seven. And that was the Greenpeace piece issue. We, uh, I worked with Greenpeace and we donated about, oh, Three or four thousand copies of uh, slow of that slow death Greenpeace issue to the various to about sixty or seventy chapters around the world, where they sold it to make money for their, their own Greenpeace offices. And we even put on one time the the Rainbow. I got to be friends with these guys early on, and the Rainbow Warrior came into San Francisco with an empty tank, fuel tank, and. There was a radio station named KSAN, you might remember. Yeah, I, I do. And they were friends of mine there, so they gave me all this free advertising. And we had a Grateful Dead concert on the boat down by where Pier 39 is now uh, in San Francisco. The admission was like $5. You know, but we filled up the tank of the, the Rainbow Warrior. So. Yeah, so that was the Greenpeace issue, but on the cover that Bill had done on the original, uh, that was that was when the harp seals were being clubbed to death up in Canada, and there was a uh, a prohibition of that, and there was a guy named was it was it Galoob who made toys here in San Francisco, and they made a a baby harp seal toy to look like that, so that kids could you know. Yeah, Galoob. Cultural thing going on. Anyway, uh, Bill has done the cover now, you know, from like 30 years later. And the guy who is saving the harp seal from the evil hunters on that cover is now in a skeleton, but he's still got the same old park on. Uh -huh. And he's got all the other animals. Are, you'll see if you have the cover to yeah. show for Slow Death Zero. I have it on one of my slides from the beginning of the show. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, yeah, so so that that's where the connection is. But Stout's done like 80 different murals for natural history museums and things since then. And he's like in big supply, you know, big, big demand for his dinosaurs and his natural history whales. <laughs> And I was seeing in some of the, in the last issue, there's an Alan Moore, Brian Talbot story in issue number 11. And there's a Wally yes. Wood story. Yes. Okay. Well, so, and that's in the book, right? So this was, this is one of these sad things. It's like, 
we got all this stuff in, and then I couldn't find it. It went like missing. And uh, Greg Irons had died, and his cover was missing for for that last issue. And when we moved in 93 from around the corner, from Bryant Street around to Florida Street, uh-huh. uh, this one big giant file came out, this whole, you know, big metal file. And at the very bottom, what had happened was it looked like the package had gotten in, and it, when it opened up, and got caught in between and fell down and went underneath it. So there it sat for like 10 years. And then I finally, you know, published it. And, uh, but it was like, you know, the one thing about undergrounds is they needed to come out every few months or so. They weren't like regular. Right. But they, but what, but if you didn't bring them out at a certain frequency, people's interests went off. Right. If you could do them on a regular, like every couple of three months, you know, at least, you could almost do them forever, it seemed like. Man, to- to- make, makes total perfect. sense. Makes total sense to me. Uh, so, uh, wait, we got some more questions here. Um, Ron, do you think that more book publishers are investing in sequential stories, hiring creators, but it's just the direct market model that is suffering in sales? So I think what, what they're asking here is, is it are comics really selling great in the whole, everywhere except comic book stores right now? What, what do you think about that concept? Well, not having a retail store and not buying anything from Marvel and DC, uh, as Robert Crumb once said, that what's di- what's the difference between underground and above ground? He says, well, they don't come out regularly. You know, so uh, I I don't know the exact answer to that, but I do know that the level of the craft of writing has suffered tremendously. I think the storylines uh, cannot be made up by cute art. You know. Right. So, and I think that the storylines are very weak these days. Huh. Are you reading comics, Ron? What are you into, man? What do you read in I, these days? I read a soup can label. I read anything. <laughs> but comics-wise, what's pushed your buttons in, say, recent years that you can think of that really that you did enjoy? Is there stuff, or, or are you mostly tuned out to the comic scene? Oh, well, of course, anything by Alan Moore or Gaiman or any of the uh you know rick veach he's he's in the slow death uh zero is tom veach re- related to rick yeah, veach? It's his older brother okay all right tom, tom, tom and greg irons were the gi tv greg irons tom veach so that story uh, where, where where this picture comes from i don't know if you can see this oh yeah there i am see, i love <laughs> This so this was like my first issue of Slow Death that I read was that one and it's such a great issue and that story had you in it so since that you just loomed larger than life in my mind as as Big Ron. Well, it's uh, pretty big, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we got one more question here. This she's been asking this uh, all night. She won't, oh no, not this one. Uh, wants to know about the punk rock scene putting out books about the hardcore punk rock scene in San Francisco, Jell-O, Biafra, et cetera. What do you got to say about that, Ron? Well, we did do a lot. Uh, one of the things that bothered me when I started doing trade paperbacks, rather than just uh, on other subjects other than cartoon things, was that for the most part, the hippies, hippie era and the beatnik era, most of the books written were by people that had nothing to do with that. So when the punk scene was going on, I thought, well, this is a perfect time to start getting things done by the people who are actually part of the scene and who are actually living it. So we did that. We did uh, Peter Belsito and uh, F. Stop Fitzgerald and you know, a, lot, a lot of different punk rock people put things together. We, we still have coming out. It didn't get out before the virus, but a history of the Mabuhai Gardens and Dirk Dirksen, who ran this club, which had three bands a night for 10 years. That's you know, 10,000 bands in San Francisco. So we covered most of the punk rock scene. Um, that's all, you worked with so many great guys. It's, I mean, just oh, Jello, Jello, when we did a thing on the dead Kennedys, we did a band, you know, uh, my good friend Winston Smith did the 
DK logo and did all their covers and album covers and things for years. And so Joe didn't trust anybody. A lot of people, it's kind of like a, you know, a lot of people don't trust you because you're the businessman, you know, you're the, and, and you are the businessman, but you try to be a fair guy, you know, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes the prejudices are such, and Joe is one of these that has a prejudice like that. So uh, we were doing this book on them. And at the last minute, we were just about to go to press and they said, oh, we, we, we have to withdraw our support of this book. This is a commercial venture. It's a the duh, yes, it's called publishing. It's definitely right. publishing. Yeah, but they were like getting real pissy about it. So we brought it out as the um uh you know not, not official version, Dead Kennedys. And then I said, I said, but Jello, I said, this is not enough. I said, well, I have to give, I'm giving you an entire page to say whatever you want. I will not say anything at all. Change it, I won't change a dot or across the T or anything. It's all yours. Here's the whole page. And uh, you got till like, you know, three weeks from now or so, two months from now. And he he uh, didn't respond very quickly. So finally I says, well, I'm going to put a big sign on this page saying that you had the opportunity to say what you wanted, but you, re you, you didn't take it up. So then the page came in at the last minute. <laughs> and we printed it. And we printed it in the comic, you know, into the uh, book. And that went through many, many printings. That, uh, that was good. We did the Hardcore California book that was good. Um, we did Street Art book, which was all the early punk posters. We did, we did a lot of those things. And we, we're still supporting punk music and punk, you know, things like that. Is that your, is that your bag, Ron? What kind of music do you like to listen to? Uh, I love folk music and I love heavy metal. That seems right to me. That just seems right for Ron Turner. Um, what's your favorite heavy metal band? Oh, well, I... Um, it's hard It's hard to make a judgment. Uh-huh. Amazing. Yeah. Well, you don't uh, got to pay. Uh, Metallica okay. is one of my favorites. Uh, one of the Metallica guys... I remember coming in when he was a little kid coming into Gary's store in San Francisco buying comics. Uh huh. That's awesome. So it's totally into horror. Um, well, you've been you've been such a part of the scene, the Bay Area. You've just been a Bay Area fixture, a comics lit fixture. Uh, we're gonna shut down the viewer Q and A for now, and I got one last thing for before we gotta go, Ron. Okay. So this is this is we talked about you starting out at San Francisco State during a time of a lot of social turmoil and upheaval. Okay. And we got that in spades right now, brother, right now going on in your city and all over this country and all over the world. I want to hear your thoughts on <clears throat> the kind of predictions of the futures you guys made in slow death and in your other books and where we've gone now. And do you think, well, what's your prediction for the future? Uh -huh. This is a rough one, Ron. I know this is a lot to ask, but. I suggest you listen to the bells of Rumney. Uh, Pete Seeger. Okay. Listen to that. And uh, and Phil Oaks, listen to uh, Here's to the State of Mississippi. You listen to those two songs and you have my sense of the future. Okay. I love that. Here's uh, I'm going to check those out for sure. And I know our inquiring viewers will seek those out as well. Who knows? Maybe I'll bring them back on a, on a later show. Um, Ron, I, I want to really thank you for, for your time, taking this time to be here and talk to me, um, and talk to all these people and answer these questions, man, you, the stuff that you've put out is really important to me. And I know it's really important to, I'm going to say millions and millions of people out there all over the world. Thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome. And I, I think that we're all going to get out of this, uh, virus world Yeah. and things that come back better. People, this has been a good time for families that have been sequestered together. They're getting a chance for, to get away from the rat race and the spinning, you know, wheel. They get off the, you know, get out of the, the rat wheel now, you know, the hamster wheel. It's not it's tearing people apart. 
and now they can at least be together and be happy and be families, and that's very that's the key. You know, so good point. Good solid. point. Good point, Ron. There's nothing I hate worse than crash crass commercialism. Oh, hey, but hey, did you know that Comic Book News now has memberships? Guys, you can sign up for different tiers of membership levels and pay me money every single month if you want to. Check that out. We'll talk about that more at the end of the show. <laughs> Rod, you've been a great sport. Thank you for coming here. If you've got a few minutes to stick around, I know it's late. If, if you got to go, you got to go. If you stick around, though, I want to talk to you afterwards, but I'm gonna, I got to wrap things up here on the show. Okay, you wrap. Okay, I'll see you. Um, uh, stick around. Guys, that was Ron Turner, okay? And um, dude's legit. He's been there. He's seen a lot of things. He's seen a lot of things, made a lot of predictions, published a lot of comics um, that made predictions about where they thought the world was going. Did it get worse or did it get better since then? I don't know, man. Look around us and see if we've solved the problems that they laid out in Slow Death and Anarchy Comics and other places. Um I don't know if we've got the answers or not. We'll find out soon enough. I liked his positivity at the end. I like he's a pro art guy from, from the bottom of his heart. He's a San Francisco person. He, that's the reason I love living in San Francisco is you get people like this. That, that's more the norm in San Francisco than the exception, right? People that are just open to different ideas and countercultural expressions and just, you know, have an open mind about stuff. So I love talking to Ron. It was fantastic. Um, Guys, so real quick, I'm going to talk about memberships. I don't expect too many people to sign up for this thing. I, I It's experimental. YouTube just offered that feature. Basically, if you sign up at these varying levels, you can click the little subscribe button down there. You can sign up and you can uh, get your name in the credits at the beginning of the show or at, or at the end of the show, depending on the level. And if you go for the mega level, the Gem Mint 10 level, if you will, um, you get to produce a segment on comic book news. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You pick the topic. We'll put a panel together. And if you want to be, you can be on that panel and discuss it with an august body of comic book pros. Um, I make no guarantee who's going to be there, but it's going to be fun. We'll make it fun. We'll talk about comics. I've already got one of those subscribers. Um, so please tune in next time. We're going to have Stu Colson from Comic Hub here and he's going to talk about he's going to give a whole overview of of his product and what it can do for stores this is part of our comic shop 2.0 series where we're trying to redefine what a comic book store means in in the future um so thanks thanks everybody for watching and now uh, we're going to go out with uh, my closing credits and this is just an example of how the closing credits will look look for where your name might appear in future credit sequences oh and, and in case you think it's time to tune out who knows? There just might be a post credit sequence. Check it out. See you next time. I don't drive a car because they run on gas. And if I did, it is run on biomass. I ride a bike or sometimes a skateboard. So fuck off all you drivers and your yummy hordes. Sitting all day in the traffic queues. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't eat meat. Live on moldy chives or the donuts that I found in last week's dumpster dives. When you people in that restaurant, I think you are so sad when you could have been eating bagels like the ones that I just had. I think it is the same all the birds wanting to do. I'm a better anarchist than you. I don't wear leather and I like my clothes in black. And I made a real cool hammock from a moldy coffee sack. I like to hop on freight trains. I think that it's so cool. Hey, this is Rob Liefeld, Deadpool, Cable, Domino, X-Force, New Mutants, Image Comics, all of it. What is up? Uh, coming to you live here from my uh, beautiful uh, home office to tell you all that there is a YouTube show that you absolutely have to check out, the Comic Book News. Comic Book News with Dan Shaheen. Dan Shaheen. He's got your Comic Book News for you. The latest, the greatest. 
the bestest of the restest with Dan Shaheen on the Comic Book News. Go to YouTube, search Comic Book News. There's probably going to be a link with this. Hit that. Check it out. You love comics. I love comics. I love nothing more than to hear news about comics and upcoming comics. And Dan's your man. He's got your news. Comic Book News. Dan Shaheen. Check it out. Rob Liefeld. Out.